right, that is spectacular. So welcome everybody to our first ever uh, live at a distance uh, Austin, uh, Austin Variations event. And I'm so glad you guys came. This is uh, Jeff in June. And we have got this weekend and next weekend booked with all sorts of really spectacular events. We have talks, question and answer sessions, uh, we've got, I think, a panel discussion. We've got readings from various authors. And we have a couple of plays scheduled, which I think is just brilliant. Uh, I, I'm so excited that we, we were able to get that on the schedule. So uh, thank you for coming. Please check the Facebook page for the latest schedule updates. Uh, we've got this weekend fairly well planned out. But next weekend, we, we could have some tweaking depending on the things that we learned this weekend. Because like we said, we're kind of a work in progress here, figuring out exactly how to make this work. Uh, so keep an eye on the Facebook calendar for uh, what's going on next weekend. And we'll be sending out another link for the Zoom meeting for next weekend uh, so that everybody can join up then. One word. So let's, uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to mute all the microphones for now so that we don't get the background noise. Because what happens is we get background noise from 35 different mics and it, it gets really difficult to hear. Uh, so let me try to do that and unmute myself then so that I can keep talking. So cross some fingers that that's going to work. So uh, search device manager. All right. Can everybody still hear me? It looks like that's working. So there is a chat function on your uh, Zoom. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you move your little mouse over your screen and then look at the bottom. There's a little chat bubble that says chat underneath. So we're going to use that if you have any questions as we go along, because hopefully we'll have a little bit of question and answer time after we're done, or if there's just a burning question as I'm, as I'm talking, uh, feel free to put it up in the chat and I will definitely uh, try to answer those questions because hopefully, maybe, fingers crossed, I will actually have the answer, which is always a, you know, one of those risks you take when you start speaking on something like, oh gosh, I hope someone doesn't ask me something I don't know. <laughs> but. Uh, we're going to be talking about chocolate in Jane Austen's day. Now, one of the things that we tend to hear a lot about is drinking chocolate in the Regency, because that was probably the way most people experienced chocolate, but that wasn't the only way. And we're going to get into a bunch of that uh, tonight. But to start with, I want to do a flyby history of chocolate in the Regency era. So I'm going to attempt to share a screen here and I'll kind of go back and forth from sharing the screen uh, to being able to talk to you guys. Um, chocolate showed up in Europe first in the Spanish court and it, there's kind of a debate about whether it came from Cortez or uh, some other information that's a little bit newer suggests that it was actually a Dominican priest who brought high-ranking Mayan nobles to visit the Spanish court of King Philip II. And they made chocolate for King Philip. And that was the introduction of chocolate in Europe. Now, it was a very potent, very bitter drink. Not at all like what we're used to drinking chocolate or eating chocolate today. The Spaniards play with, played with it for a while and figured out how to add sugar to it. And then it skyrocketed in, in popularity. Once you add sugar to something, it gets good, right? <laughs> and chocolate was, was absolutely no exception. So chocolate took off once they kind of changed the formulation and made it more palatable to European palates. It spread from Spain to Italy to Germany and to France. And along its spread, it, it kept changing the formulation, changed the way that it was served a little bit. And then physicians kind of got a hold of it and decided that it was a cure for many diseases. So there was a whole line of research, as it were, was in the era, or recommendations is probably a better way to call it, of ways to use chocolate medicinally, which, you know, 
I, I think all of us think that's a good idea. We, especially right now, I don't know about you, but I'm definitely seeking out uh, chocolate and medicinal levels at the moment, you know, just about on a daily basis. It wasn't um, until it got to France that it was able to hop over to England and we saw chocolate making its way into England. That was about the 1650s is when we saw that happen. Um, sorry, trying to scroll through here. Uh, and I've got so many things on my computer, it's not sure which screen I'm looking at here. Um, chocolate came over in the 1650s and started in the royal courts. And we'll get to a little bit more detail on uh, chocolate in the royal courts in a couple of minutes. Um, but it was definitely expensive. It was an import. And of course, because it was an import, it was taxed very heavily, which put it out of the range for the average person or even the middle class to have access to. So it was really a luxury good that was first limited to the royal courts, but then it moved into the chocolate houses. 1657 is when we mark the first chocolate house appearing. Now, a chocolate house was the Starbucks of the Georgian era, is, is really the best way to think about it. It was, it was like Starbucks today. And they didn't just serve chocolate, they often served coffee and tea and cider, which in that era was hard cider, as well as chocolate. But since chocolate, for a lot of reasons, was the most um, difficult drink to produce and the most expensive, that's really what uh, chocolate, that's really where the name of the houses came from. They became chocolate houses. Uh, and one way that, a kind of sneaky way to tell how popular chocolate became, uh, in seven, 1673, in um, a publication, a lover of his country took off on a tirade about the dangers of chocolate. Uh, it was in the Harley and Miscellanery. That's a word to say, isn't it? And he was just adamant that chocolate as well as brandy, rum, and tea should be banned because this imported article did no good and hindered the consumption of good old English grown barley and wheat. So the, the fact that people are getting a little upset about it is kind of a hint that maybe it was really popular. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, chocolate was also tied, the rise of chocolate was tied to the Industrial Revolution. And we can see major leaps in the production and availability of chocolate with different um, advents in technology. In the early 1700s, uh, hydraulic and steam-driven chocolate mills were invented. And that started to drop the price of chocolate and make it accessible to much more everyday people. About 1730 is when we see the price really dropping and chocolate moving from being really exclusively in the chocolate houses to being much more accessible in the home. And that was because the chocolate mills could crush the chocolate nibs and make, the make tablets, which were the quick and easy way to be able to use chocolate. And I'll get in into more depth in that in a few minutes. Uh, so we see a big change in the, the consumption of chocolate in the 1730s. Um, in 1824, we see the first hot chocolate that's more like what we know today. And that's from Cadbury, which is a name we still know in the chocolate industry. Uh, in 1828, uh, the chocolate press was invented, which allowed us to separate cocoa butter from cocoa powder that lowered the prices again, and that's where we get chocolate bars. Because now we can control the amount of cocoa butter and the, versus the amount of cocoa powder. That's what's crucial for making a chocolate bar. So we didn't see real candy bars until 1824, where we're now out of Jane Austen's era, out of the, re out of the Regency, 
and more heading into the Victorian era. The first commercial chocolate bar came out in 1847, and we see Nestle's, which we know today, coming along in 1875. And all of those are following, again, uh, different processes that started to affect the production of chocolate tied to the Industrial Revolution. So, uh, I mentioned a minute ago that preparing drinking chocolate was uh, quite a production. And I'm going to switch off this screen for a minute because there are a lot of words there. And I just want to talk about it for a minute. Um, originally, back in the early 1700s, when you went to prepare chocolate, you went to the store and you bought a sack of cocoa nibs, which are larger than coffee beans, but it's kind of the, the equivalent, the chocolate equivalent of a coffee bean. It's this hard nut. And you stared at it for a while and you wondered, well, what do I do with it? And the answer was an awful lot. We had to do an awful lot with those cocoa nibs. And we see uh, recipes, um, Hannah Glass is the, the first recipe I'll put up, but that's in the, the late 1600s, early 1700s. And it starts with taking six pounds of cocoa nibs, a pound of anise seeds, which are licorice flavored. They're little tiny, um, almost like um, caraway seeds. And uh, four ounces of long pepper, an ounce of cinnamon, and a quarter pound of almonds, a pound of pistachios, and as much achiote, which will, achiote is a very, very mild dried pepper, which doesn't have a lot of flavor, but it's used as a coloring. It's a natural food coloring. And in the Southwest, you see it uh, used a lot to create yellows and oranges. So you added it to make it a nice brick color. Uh, you added musk and ambergris, which is, um, the product is sperm whales and some sugar, nutmeg, and then you beat them to a paste. And you beat them some more and you beat them some more. Um, I'm going to show you the picture of what this thing that we beat it with looked like. There you go. And this is a chocolate stone. And if you look at the center, you can see the, the ground cocoa. So you have this slab of stone, and if you look underneath it, there's a place for heat for a heat source. There's, you ideally put it over hot coals or a fire to heat the stone, because that helps to free the oils from the cocoa. And you see the roller on top, basically a mortar and pestle. And you started grinding this, and you start grounding and you ground it some more, and you ground it some more. And eventually, as you grind the cocoa beans down enough, the oil is liberated from the cocoa beans, and it all forms an oily paste. And that's what you were looking for when you prepared the cocoa, because then you took this paste, which you mixed with all these spices that uh, this first recipe, Hannah Glass, suggests, which the anise seeds, the pepper, the cinnamon, the nutmeg, and uh, the almonds and pistachios. You mix all this together with the sugar and then you scrape it into molds, usually small boxes, to create tablets. Once you have le these tablets made, then you can actually start using the chocolate. So there were hours of preparation involved before you could actually get to the point of doing anything with the chocolate at all. This is part of the reason why it was such a luxury good. Most working people, if they could afford the cocoa nibs and the spices, which were also very expensive, they simply didn't have time to invest in all the work that it took to create a chocolate tablet. Uh, in a second recipe, uh, the second one on the screen, you can see that there's um, vanilla is added to the chocolate. And in this case, the spelling is V-A-N-E-L-A, which is an old spelling for vanilla. And an interesting bit here is though we think of vanilla today as kind of the ubiquitous flavor of everything, 
uh, vanilla started out in England largely as a flavoring to add to chocolate. And it was only much later that it started to be used at, on its own. Now that's a whole nother presentation, but just you know, a little tidbit to add in here. Um, and in this second recipe, cardamom was added to the chocolate. So what we have here is not the, the sweet milk chocolate or even the dark chocolate that we're used to eating today. This was a heavily spiced, heavily seasoned concoction that was much more reminiscent of the uh, drink that the Mayans brought over to Spain than it is to what we would eat today. Now, once the chocolate tablet was created, then we could store that for later use to, to be made into primarily drinking chocolate. And it was in the 1730s with the advent of the chocolate press that these tablets could be made on a fairly large scale for commercial use. So that's when we see a lot more people making drinking chocolate at home because of the availability of affordable chocolate tablets. So what you would do once you had the chocolate tablet, you would grate the tablet. And of course they had special graters, but if you didn't have that, you just use your knife or whatever you had. And you grated that into milk, boiled it, added egg yolk and boiled it some more. And then you would take this tool that, that's up on the slide called a, a molinette or a molinilla or a chocolate mill. The English called them chocolate mills. The, um, Spanish still call them molinillas, and you, you can actually find them in markets today, uh, and the French call it a molinette, but it's a whip that you would put into the vessel you were cooking your chocolate. And you see how there's a long, narrow handle? You put it between your palms and you rub it briskly, and you keep rubbing because the idea is to bring up a foam. Maria Grace, excuse me, yeah. I'm interrupting. Uh, we have people trying to get in and they say that the room has been locked by the host. Okay, let me take a look at that. I got to stop screen sharing so I can look at all the... Uh... Okay, forgive me here. Um, let's see, I'm... Do you have any idea where that control would be? No, I don't. Um, I'm looking here. Try under more at the bottom of the screen. All I see there is stop live stream. Hmm. I'll go do some hunting and keep talking and I'll come back if I find something out. Yeah, please, I am so sorry because I didn't knowingly do that. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't, um, but I'll let you know when I find something. Yeah, please do. I am so sorry for that. No problem. I'm just, uh, forgive me for just one second. I'm trying to look at the controls here. Uh, I just saw a comment on the chat. Yeah, the recipe is very similar to- uh, Maria, uh, Maria, yes. I just yes. saw that lock, I unlocked it. Okay, where did you find the lock? It was in, it was down with the uh, three dots at the bottom, at the very bottom of it where it says mute and everything else had locked meeting. That was, it, that was clicked. I unclicked it, so. Uh, okay, thank you. Because since I started the live stream, I actually don't have those commands on this Okay, side. I got it, it's all taken care of. Excellent, thank you so much. So thank you everybody for your patience as we're still learning all the uh, gizmos here. Uh, but yeah, there, I see a comment that this sounds like the recipe that they use in Mexico. And yeah, this is very, very similar uh, to uh, Mexican hot chocolate. And actually the best analog we have today to Regency drinking chocolate is the kind of hot chocolate that's prevalent in Mexico, which by the way is really good stuff. Uh, if anybody's interested in trying it, there is a product you can buy at the grocery store. The brand is Abuelita and it's a Mexican chocolate tablet made specifically for making hot chocolate. And it's a great start. It's uh, got a lot of cinnamon in it and uh, a very granular sugar. Actually, I like to just chew on them straight from the box, but that's another story. Can you spell that brand? A-B-U-E-L-I-T-A. Put it in the chat here. Abuelita. It means grandmother. Uh, Gina asked, what is a long pepper? Uh, oh yeah, it is a Nestle brand. You're right, Chris. I, I just re remember it as Abuelita. 
um, I don't really know which kind of pepper is a long pepper, but it's not a bell pepper. It's um, more of a spicy pepper. I do know that much, uh, but I really haven't been able to trace down which one exactly was the long pepper. Uh, so, trying to find my train of thought again. Yes, yeah, cinnamon sticks, Danielle, are really good. I love chocolate and cinnamon together. And that was a very common flavoring used in the Regency. Uh, so it was such a production to make uh, hot chocolate or make drinking chocolate in the morning. Sometimes what they would do would be make it halfway. And I'm gonna share the screen again to show you this recipe because I think it's fun. I love old recipes. I think they're just fascinating to look at. Um, so they cut the chocolate, they put it in the, in the water and boiled it to kind of make um, a chocolate liquid, almost a chocolate syrup. And then that was available to make quick chocolate, instant almost in, in that era where you could just add a couple spoonfuls to milk and boil it with the sugar and then use the chocolate milk. So people liked chocolate a lot and were looking for ways to make it easier to drink because it was so very labor intensive uh, to manage. Now, chocolate was possibly consumed all day. However, it was really a breakfast food. That's what the most common time to have chocolate was. But sometimes people like to have it last thing in the day. Uh, one of the cookbooks that I like by Perkins, it's, it's from the era, I uh, can't remember whether it was in the 1770s or the early 1800s. I, I just can't remember which one that was. I could look it up if anybody's interested. But he says of chocolate, that is a wholesome kind of breakfast to those who like it and, and with whom it agrees. Um, though he does suggest making it a little bit less rich uh, to be really appropriate. Uh, so people drank chocolate in the morning and often chocolate and toast was a very common breakfast in the Regency or you know that, that was how you started your day, which wasn't necessarily first thing in the morning either. Uh, normally you got up and did a few chores and breakfast often happened around 10 a.m. But ladies, uh, as you see in the painting there, would take chocolate in their dressing rooms in the morning. Uh, and generally you see that this lovely woman was definitely not making her own chocolate. She definitely had the wealth with which to buy it. Uh, you can see because she's wearing a white uh, house coat there and there are no spots on it. There are no chocolate spots on it. And when you mill the chocolate, it flies. I, I've tried it with the Molinia at home and that stuff flies, which also explains some of the features of the chocolate pot, which we're gonna talk about in just a minute. Um, I mentioned earlier that chocolate wound up in the royal palaces first and foremost, and it was very much a staple of breakfast in the palace. In 18, I mean, sorry, 1686, Charles II empl employed the first royal chocolate maker. And George I, the beginning of our Georgian era, and the, Georgian, the Regency era where Austin was writing is the tail end of the Georgian era, which is called the Georgian era for George I, George II, George III, and George IV. So we lump them all together and it's the Georgian era. Uh, the Regency is the very tail end of that. So our first George employed Thomas Tozier as his royal chocolate maker. Now, that might not sound like a huge deal, but as royal chocolate maker, one of his duties was to bring chocolate into the king's bedroom for him to consume in the morning with his breakfast. He had direct access to the king to bring in his chocolate. That was a huge privilege and security risk. I mean, <laughs> let's be real there. Uh, so all that to say, his chocolate maker was a really big deal. Interestingly, and this is, this is a little side note, but I think it's fascinating. Uh, Tozier also ran a chocolate house 
on a stretch of road no, known as Chocolate Row, where there were a lot of chocolate houses. And when Thomas was busy in the palace, he turned the running of his chocolate house over to his wife, Grace Tozier. And this woman had a knack for business. She turned around and she branded their chocolate house as the royal chocolatier, the royal chocolate house, supplier to the king. And consequently became incredibly popular so popular that they eventually ended up expanding the chocolate house to put a dance floor in because they were extremely social venues. The chocolate houses, which I'll talk about more in just a second, they were extremely social venues. And so they had so much patronage that they expanded to include a dance floor. And she became kind of a celebrity in her own right to the point where she had um, her portrait taken and it was hung. Oh, let me get my note because I don't want to miss this um, detail. She had her um, portrait taken and uh, it was uh, by Bartholomew Dandridge and it was made into a collectible celebrity print. So basically she was on a celebrity trading card of the day uh, because she became so well known for her chocolate house. And after her husband died, when she remarried, she kept the Tozier name because of the branding power that it had. She recognized in the early 1700s, she recognized the power of her brand name and kept it even when she remarried uh, after her husband's death. So I just, I just think that's kind of a, a cool uh, side note to women in chocolate. Uh, in 1690, the Hampton Court Palace was remodeled and part of the remodel included a special kitchen devoted to chocolate making entirely. Uh, the picture of the chocolate stone that I showed you came from the uh, recreation of the Hampton Court Palace Kitchen. And if you uh, look online, you can see, you can find a video tour of that palace kitchen itself, or you can go to my website, uh, Random Bits of Fascination, and do a search on chocolate. And you can find that video on my site as well. And they actually demonstrate uh, grating the chocolate and so forth. And it's just, it's absolutely fascinating, but that's how important chocolate was to royalty, that they wanted a specialized kitchen just to keep chocolate close at hand and easily available. Now, something that good, which we could also read as with that much room for profit, is not going to stay closeted for very long. Uh, the chocolate houses began, as I said before, in um, 1657. And the first chocolate house was called the Coffee Mill and Tobacco Roll. It was opened by Frenchmen in um, London in 1657. Needless to say, a good idea doesn't stay isolated very long. And uh, a number of establishments went ahead and opened as well to sell chocolate, including whites. Whites we know of in the Regency era as an exclusive gentleman's club. Uh, and we, we read about it in different books where um, our aristocratic heroes were members at whites. It's an exclusive uh, club just for gentlemen to interact with other gentlemen. Well, White's started out as a chocolate house. It only became a gentleman's club at the end of the 1700s when uh, the chocolate houses were declining in popularity as people were able to afford and make chocolate for themselves. Uh, so a number of those exclusive clubs really started out as chocolate and coffee houses and changed their nature when the economics of chocolate changed. So there, there is definitely a political side uh, to drinking chocolate. 
it, it a lot of political conversations and probably deals and careers were made and broken over uh, discussions in chocolate houses. So there's, there's a, a lot of intrigue surrounding it. Um, but in the, into the 1730s, chocolate tablets became more affordable. And as it moves into its home, in, into the home, we see specialized accessories uh, coming into vogue for drinking chocolate. You know, I have no idea why that shifted back there. Um, this is exactly what happens today. Okay, go to Amazon or you know, wherever you like to shop for kitchen gizmos. Can we talk about the Instapot for a moment? That little gizmo has come on the, on the scene. It is basically a safe pressure cooker, you know, that's much less likely to explode on you than the old fashioned kind. And it has taken the culinary world by storm. Everything is Instapot. We started out and you used to be able to find an Instapot. And now there are 753,000 gadgets to go along with your Instapot. Because once you have that, then you're going to want this and that and the other thing to go along with it. Chocolate was kind of similar. Now, the gadgets that we have in this case really revolve around the making and the serving of chocolate. Uh, as I said before, let me change the screen share here for a second. As I said before, when making chocolate in the kitchen, you needed a grater for the chocolate. But you could substitute that and use, use a knife or whatever great, other grater you had. You needed a heavy bottom sauce pot so that you wouldn't scald or burn the chocolate while you were cooking it. You needed something to stir it with. You needed the chocolate milk. People improvised that all the time. Um, people also improvised the chocolate pots and the chocolate cups, which I'll talk about in just a second, just like we do today. Because, you know, if you wanted enough, you're going to figure out a way to make it work. So you might be drinking chocolate out of a pewter uh, beer tanker. Okay, you still get to enjoy your chocolate. But the, the China associated with chocolate was unique and special and was definitely a place where people could kind of show off what they had. Chocolate pots were one of the, um, sorry, my screen here just did something weird. Can everybody see my um, slide? Not at me, somebody, if you can see the slide or if you're looking at me. Okay, you see the slide. The slide's Great. not showing. It's not showing? The slide is not showing. Okay, let's try this again here. What's showing, what's your word document? Okay, I think I know what happened. All right, let's try this again. Now do we have slide? Yes. yes. Okay, excellent, thank you. So there were special serving pots designed specifically for chocolate that were different than teapots and coffee pots. And what's really fun now today is if you go on eBay and look for antiques, you will find listings for chocolate coffee teapot. And you look at this thing and it is clearly not a chocolate pot and it's either a teapot or a coffee pot. A lot of things that are sold as, as chocolate pots aren't. And it's because people have no idea that they really, really are different. And the differences are based in the nature of the beverage itself. So looking at the chocolate pots, okay, one of the big distinctions, okay, the, this first one here is one of the oldest and it, it kind of shows it's not really pretty, but as we get to the prettier ones, the more expensive ones, we can see some of the distinctions more clearly. The, pot, the spout of a chocolate pot, you can see on these, is mounted up very high at the top of the pot and the pot itself is tall and narrow. Well, it's tall and narrow to help concentrate the froth, to get it up at the top and to hold it there. And the spout is up at the top, so when you pour it, you get some of the froth pouring out when you pour the chocolate into the cup. 
If you look at the top of the chocolate pot, and I don't know if you can see my mouse, but here and here, you see there's a little opening where the handle of the chocolate mill can stick out so you can close the lid and spin the chocolate mill to keep the froth up while you're serving the chocolate. And that's one of the ways you can prevent getting covered in chocolate splatter when you're serving from a polite sort of way. Now, some of the early chocolate pots have this weird little feature where the handle is mounted at the side. Instead of being opposite the spout, it's 90 degrees from the spout. And that was kind of the original way to do it. If you ever see a pot where the handle is mounted straight and 90 degrees from the spout, you know it's a chocolate pot because they were the only ones that ever did it. Uh, later on, they started making the chocolate pots where the handle was at the back. And this was one of those trips down the research rabbit hole that took me actually a couple of days to find anybody who had a clue why they did it. And the best that they've been able to figure out is there was a shift in popularity from the straight handled pots on the side to the ones with the handle on the rear, like in this slide, because it took a lot of wrist strength to pour from a straight handle 90 degrees to the spout. And a lot of women weren't strong enough to manage the pot well. So when you move the handle to the back, it becomes much easier to pour. So some chocolate pots have a handle 90 degrees from the spout, some in the back. But you can see in all of these examples that we have the removable finial here so you can stick the chocolate mill through the top and mill your chocolate to create the foam while the lid is shut. And the high wide spout on all of these marks it as a chocolate pot. That's how you tell a chocolate pot. There, this is a setting with both a chocolate coffee and teapot, then the chocolate pot is in the back. Teapots, you remember the, the, the old song, I'm a little teapot short and stout? Well, teapots are short and stout. The reason that they're short and stout is because they need room for the tea leaves to move around on the inside of the pot. So teapots are always gonna be short and fat. You don't ever do chocolate in a short fat pot. You can't raise the foam on it that way. So a teapot is gonna be short and fat and have a handle that leaves room to keep your fingers away from the teapot because the temperature tea brews at is hot enough to burn you. It's over 200 degrees, I believe. Uh, and you will get burned by the water for uh, tea where you won't so much with uh, chocolate or coffee. Coffee brews best at 180 degrees, which isn't gonna burn you the way um, boiling water for tea will. Chocolate brews in a tall, narrow pot, but the spout is near the bottom. If you look at the, the um, spout for the coffee pot, it is much closer to the bottom. And this is all about keeping it warm. So a coffee pot is designed to keep the coffee warm. A teapot is designed for brewing space. And a chocolate pot is designed to give you uh, the ability to create the foam and to hang on to it. That's why all the pots are different. And a proper Regency era hostess would have chocolate pots, teapots, and coffee pots, assuming she could afford them. The cups are the same way. Chocolate cups are very distinct and different from teacups. And I think they're really, really cool. Uh, because of the issue with the foam, coffee, or excuse me, chocolate cups are tall and narrow to keep that foam going so it doesn't dissipate over a wide cup. So in all of these, you see how they're very narrow at the top. Well, the problem is when you get something tall and narrow, it's very apt to spill. It knocks over and spills. So some clever person decided to put this nifty little rail into most coffee saucers or to create um, a deep well to set the cup in. They're called tremulous, tremblusse, tremblusse, I don't speak French and it's a French word and I have trouble with it, uh, saucers because if your hand trembles, it doesn't knock the cup over. So chocolate cups may have two 
uh, handles on them. Sometimes they have lids, but they're always taller and narrower than teacups. And they sit in these really cool little railed saucers. And that's how you can tell a coffee cup. I have seen a chocolate cup from a coffee cup or a teacup. Uh, these are some close-ups of the Tremblusse saucers that I just, I think it's neat to look and see those, those little rails and how they're designed to hold the cups in place so you don't spill your very expensive and difficult to make chocolate. Uh, Teacups are wide with a big handle designed to keep your hand from being burnt by the hot china. And teacups are all about cooling the beverage. That's why they're short and wide, to cool down the tea to drinkable temperatures. Coffee cups are taller because they want to concentrate the coffee together so you don't have so much surface area at the top to keep the coffee warm because it brews at a lower temperature. So, there's actually a reason in terms of how you consume these, make and consume these beverages for all the differences in the china that goes with them. So uh, you'll see in antique shops, lots and lots of cups that may or may not be labeled correctly. And now you have, you know, a little bit of conversation you can make when you see that, oh, do you realize that's really not a chocolate cup? Great way to start conversation. Or, you know, people sometimes give you a weird look like you've really been down the research rabbit hole for a little too long. Happens to me way too often. In any case, um, even though drinking chocolate was the primary way that we see Regency era folks being able to access chocolate, it wasn't the only way. Uh, when you start scouring cookbooks, you start finding there were a few chocolate recipes here and there. And that some of them were in specialty cookbooks really aimed at professional cooks in large establishments, large estates, large uh, homes, uh, you know, employed by the aristocracy. Some of them though were accessible to uh, more common kinds of cooks. Now, none of these or a good old fashioned chocolate bar. We, we don't see that happening until we're able to separate, separate out the um, cocoa butter from chocolate. And that again, didn't happen until the 1820s. But some of these recipes are really, really cool. And uh, I am planning to do a series on the website where we look at the historical recipes and then find modern analogs because Although a lot of these we can still make today, uh, trying to go from the original recipes, uh, you'll see is just a little bit challenging. Just, just a wee little bit, you know, like the uh, complete lack of measurements. I, I find that a little, you know, rub enough butter in, it's like, well, how much is enough? So it's sometimes a little hard to tell. Uh, but we find recipes for a few candies. Again, not chocolate, chocolate bars per se, but a couple of candies. We find recipes for biscuits or cookies, custards and creams, tarts, uh, ice cream and Italian ices, mousses, and uh, I actually found a recipe for chocolate liquor, which we will uh, get to in just a minute here. Uh, the candies basically involve mixing uh, the grated chocolate from the tablet with sugar, melting it together, and creating small drops that were, uh, might have a nut inside or like a caraway seed or something like that, um, and rolled into what were called olive shapes. They were chocolate olives in some recipes, which sounds entirely unappealing until you realize that it doesn't actually contain an olive. Um, and then these drops might be covered in sugar nonpareils. And we call that today, that candy is a nonpareil. Uh, so that was one of the candies that was accessible and available in um, Austin's era. Now, keep in mind though, that this chocolate is still gonna be pretty bitter uh, because it doesn't have uh, the milk and, and those kinds of things added to it. We're still talking about extremely spicy with 
uh, things like cinnamon, card, uh, cardamom, orange water and rose water were also pop popular flavorings added to chocolate. So even if it looked like today's chocolate, it still had all of those extra flavors added to it that set apart from what we would eat today. Uh, this recipe fascinated me. Uh, it's a chocolate conserve. And, and actually in the, in the cookbook, it was just called Of Chocolate, which I looked at and thought, okay, gee, that's really helpful. Let's see what we can suss out about this. And as I'm looking at this recipe, uh, it talks about bringing the chocolate up to Grand Plume, which took about three more dives down the rabbit hole to find that what they were talking about is heating the chocolate to softball stage, which is the stage when you, you heat the sugar and it forms a soft, squishy ball. In other words, this was fudge. This chocolate conserve that they were talking mm -hmm. about really was analogous to today's soft fudge. So this was chocolate and coffee and sugar basically mixed together for a fudge-like candy. Now there was no extra fat added to this. So there was no cream, no butter, and what we think of fudge today. But the, the closest analog I could come to this was a, uh, a mocha kind of fudge that, that was, um, soft and probably spread on toast or something like that. I don't know that for sure, but I, I just kind of uh, see that given what the recipe looks like. So those were the big ways to enjoy chocolate in candy form. Oh. Now biscuits or cookies were, were another option for the era. And there were three basically basic kinds of strategies for making cookies that I found. Uh, keep in mind that baking powder was not really readily available at this point. So in order to keep things from being flat, hard lumps, you had to find some way to incorporate air into the recipe. So usually that meant beating egg whites because egg whites will, will hold the structure and hold the air as you bake. So this first recipe for cookies is, um, let me just make sure it's the one that I'm thinking of. Yeah, this one is very much like a chocolate meringue. It's egg whites and chocolate and sugar baked. Uh, they also have something similar where a little bit of flour is added to uh, beaten egg whites with egg yolks. So that's getting into a very dense, fudgy cookie that we would eat today. Um, now the chocolate biscuit, the first chocolate biscuit I talked about is completely gluten-free because it's a meringue and only has eggs. And the second kind that I found was also gluten-free because it was almond, basically almonds pounded into a flour. So th these were, uh, they're gonna be very heavy almond flour chocolate cookies. So those were the forms of chocolate cookies that we would see. Not, uh, there weren't gonna be anything crispy and delicate and beautiful. Uh, they didn't have chocolate chips or anything like that. These were fairly dense, fudgy kinds of uh, arrangements. Um, creams and custards were another way that chocolate was commonly enjoyed. And, um, a custard is different from an American pudding because a custard is thickened by heating egg yolks where American puddings have cornstarch in them. So this would be more like the filling of an eclair, a pastry cream is what we would call it today, but uh, chocolate pastry creams and um, custards were readily available. There, lots of creams and custards were eaten in desserts in this era. Uh, so chocolate might not be the predominant flavor, but it was certainly available uh, as a flavor to uh, add to a des dessert spread. Chocolate mousses, and there were several recipes I found for this, which is basically chocolate and whipped cream together. Chocolate sugar and whipped cream. So chocolate mousses, uh, which they called chocolate cream uh, or whipped chocolate was another uh, name for it, uh, was... Uh, another form 
that it was eaten in. And you'll notice in the recipe, scrape one quart of thick cream, one ounce of best chocolate, and a quarter pound of sugar, boil and mill it. When quite smooth, take it off and leave it to be cold and add the whites of nine eggs. Not a lot of detail in these recipes. And that one in particular has more than most. Um, so trying to follow these as modern, as a modern day cook, I, I kind of look at that and go, oh, okay, that one might be all right, but some of these, like the chocolate tarts, kind of, you know, it's full of fear and trepidation. Uh, a chocolate tart is basically a pastry crust with a chocolate custard and then topped with um, meringue. So you mix a little flour and cream with a proportionable, proportionable quantity of chocolate, a bit of sugar, and three eggs. Boil it half an hour, stirring constantly for fear it should catch at the bottom. Put it into a paste, which was their term for pastry crust. And the white of eggs beaten up and frothed upon it, glaze it with sugar. Yeah, that's kind of a terrifying recipe to me. I, I, I wouldn't even know where to start on the amounts without referring to a modern day recipe. Um, and, and just, you know, for interest's sake, I found a recipe for the paste crust appropriate for large and small uh, custards. Make the paste pretty hard with a little butter, flour, salt, and warm water. There you go, that's your recipe. This is why people employed cooks. Because cooking was a very particular skill that you just didn't wander into the kitchen and, you know, like we do today, have largely prepared ingredients we can throw together. Cooking had to be learned and was not for the faint of heart. You know, without electric mixers, uh, just for one, there was hours worth of beating to get and crushing and, and fabricating to make things work. So th this is why people hired cooks, because it literally would take you all day to create a lot of these things. Chocolate ice cream. Ice cream was a thing in the Regency era, and actually it was very popular in the early 1800s and became more and more popular as uh, mechanisms to store ice and harvest ice became more efficient. And again, that's a whole other presentation on the ice trade. But we see uh, Francis Nutt in 1807 wrote a specialty uh, cookbook on sweets, confectionery cookbook. And he offered uh, recipes for different variations of chocolate ice cream. Ice cream was often frozen and served hard in a mold, and that was called ice cream cheese because it used a cheese mold, not because there was actually any cheese in it. Again, going through these period cookbooks can be an awful lot of fun trying to decode all of these things. Um, just as, as an aside, do you see this right here that looks like a teacup or a chocolate cup or a coffee cup? Guess what? It's an ice cream cup which is different than a tea, chocolate, or coffee cup. Part of the reason you see here is the foot on the cup. That keeps it up off the table and helps insulate the chocolate, I mean, the, excuse me, the ice cream in here to keep it cold. The handle also kept the hand away from the china, again, to help keep the ice cream cold. Uh, and the conical shape funneled the melting ice cream to the bottom of the cup away from the rest of the ice cream so it wouldn't melt as fast. So one more piece of specialty china to add to your china closet. Um, in both of these recipes, which are French recipes, the um, chocolate, instead of being done in tablet form, they basically would steep the chocolate beans and then strain them out almost like you would make coffee or tea. And then that liquid was used to make the chocolate ice cream. So it was an extremely delicate flavor of ice cream. Uh, very different than what we think of as chocolate ice cream today. Um, chocolate ice water was also popular. Water ices were extremely popular in the era, um, which in this case was chocolate simple syrup, which was sugar and water, and a pint of water, which was frozen until thick. And so that could be enjoyed in uh, any of the ice cream shops, ice houses, or ice cream houses of the day. 
So these are things that uh, Jane Austen might have had the opportunity to experience. And to kind of close it all out, um, there's a recipe for chocolate brandy. Uh, this involved four bottles of brandy and chocolate salt cloves, which you infuse the brandy with that and sugar, and then uh, clarify it to mix with the liquor. So this would be served definitely as an after dinner uh, kind of liqueur. Um, I have no idea how this would taste. I, I've talked about this recipe to people and some people think it sounds amazing and some people just like, okay, whatever you say. Uh, I, this is another one that I have not yet tried. But I will be posting more of these uh, adventures in chocolate on my website. If you uh, haven't come by, I recognize a lot of you uh, from the site already, but if you haven't had a chance to come by, it's random bits, uh, random bits of fascination. And um, come explore this more with me, because I mean, chocolate, what's not to love about that? Uh, so let's see, Katie says the chocolate brownie was invented in America in 1893 for the Columbian World Exposition in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, half a gill, Becky, I would have to look that up. I don't know off the top of my head how much half a gill is, but it, if you Google it, you can find that measurement. Uh, I've got like two minutes left. So uh, any questions or anything uh, you guys want to throw into the chat for us to talk about in the last two minutes here? Okay, well, I am really just tickled to have seen everybody. Thank you, Betty. <laughs> I am tickled to have had you guys here today. This has been such fun uh, to get out of the quarantine routine and to get to talk with you guys and see your lovely faces. I've seen people today. This is amazing. <laughs> uh, and I will go ahead and hand this off 